Hi everyone, my name is McLean Wilkinson. I am the co-founder and CEO of NewCypher. NewCypher is a data privacy layer for blockchain and decentralized applications that gives developers a way to store, share, and manage private data on public blockchains, or more specifically, these public file systems like IPFS or Swarm. So for example, if you are building a healthcare application on top of Ethereum and you want to store patient medical records on IPFS, we give you a way to have those records be private, confidential, and encrypted, but at the same time still shareable with a valid recipient. So in this case, like a healthcare provider or a doctor. So New Cypher is really this access control infrastructure for people building dApps. So some of the sort of lower hanging use cases that you could use uh, New Cypher to build would be things like a decentralized end-to-end -end encrypted shareable Dropbox where you can encrypt files, whether they're medical records, photos, um, store them on IPFS or Swarm, and then easily delegate access and share those files uh, with your photos with your, with your family or medical records with your doctor. Um, you never ever expose the underlying data or the underlying files to the storage system. You can also use NewCypher and our proxy re-encryption technology to very easily build scalable multi-user end-to-end encrypted group chats. Uh, this is actually a tricky problem, not just in a decentralized context, but also for you know, centralized group chats. If you look at Telegram, for example, um, all of those, all of their group chats are unencrypted in, in plain text, and the reason is that it's very expensive to encrypt every message for every recipient. Um, but with NewCypher, you can easily add and remove uh, participants in that group without any performance degradation. So if you imagine you know, some of these 10 or 20 or 30,000 person telegram groups or some of these ICOs and token sales, um, right now all that's totally unencrypted because it would, if telegram was to try to encrypt that end to end, it would probably just break their servers. You can easily do this uh, with NewCypher. Uh, you can also combine NewCypher with smart contracts to create data exchanges or data marketplaces or something like a decentralized Netflix or YouTube where you charge people to access encrypted video streams. So you can specify some condition that says only grant someone access if they pay, let's say, 5 ETH or 10 ETH to the data owner's address. And of course, the way we solve a lot of these same data confidentiality or data privacy problems today in a more traditional or centralized setting is with things like TLS or encryption in, in flight. Um, but fundamentally, when we use TLS, we're trusting this central service provider, whether it's Google or Dropbox. Uh, and maybe it's totally fine to trust Google or Dropbox, but not okay to trust some of the people that are trying to break into Google or Dropbox. And particularly if we extend this to decentralized world, it's a complete non-starter to trust the server or the node operator um, because it's not, it's, uh, it's not a server sitting in Google's data center or Dropbox's data center. Um, it could be an IPFS node that's in some random person's basement or in Iran or Russia or some malicious uh, nation state. So we need basically some way to enable end-to-end -end encryption for these dApps. And that's what we've created at NewCypher. So we've combined two core technologies. One is obviously decentralization using the Ethereum blockchain. And the other is a technology called proxy re-encryption. And proxy re-encryption uh, is a way to delegate and revoke access uh, to data. So the way that it works is fundamentally just a more scalable form of public key encryption. So if you think of traditional public key encryption as being very good for one-to-one -one communication, let's say I have some secret message. I want to share that secret message with any one of you in the audience. I can just encrypt it with your public key, send it across the network. You can decrypt with your private key. It works perfectly well. But if I need to share that message now, not just with one person, but with everyone in this audience, everyone in this building, you know, everyone in Mountain View, dozens or hundreds or thousands of people potentially, this uh, public, traditional public key encryption starts to scale very poorly. You have to encrypt the message a dozen, a hundred, a thousand times, send it across the network a dozen, a hundred, a thousand times. Whereas with proxy re-encryption, you can just encrypt the data one time, and I can encrypt the data under my own key, and then I can delegate access to that encrypted data to as many people as I want. Um, and the way that it works is you can use proxy re-encryption to re-key or re-encrypt data that's originally encrypted for one key into being encrypted for a different key. So you could imagine building a traditional centralized key management service using proxy re-encryption. So you have some sender or data owner, some recipient. Uh, the sender or the data owner will encrypt their data 
with their own key. They'll upload it to some storage layer. This could be IPFS or Swarm or even Amazon S3. At that point, they're the only one who has access to that data because they're the only one who has the private key. But now they want to delegate access to some third-party recipient. With proxy re-encryption, what they can do is instead of having to share their private key with the recipient, they can take that recipient's public key, take their own private key, and use those two as inputs to create something called a re-encryption key. And the only thing this re-encryption key can do is re-key or re-encrypt or transform the data um, so that it's no longer encrypted for the data owner but for the recipient. And they'll give this re-encryption key to some untrusted proxy, and the proxy can use it to perform that re-encryption. But the magic part about proxy re-encryption is that re-encryption happens without ever decrypting the data in the middle. So it's ciphertext in, ciphertext out, the proxy never has access to the plain text data, and the storage layer never has access to the plain text data either. Only the original data owner and whoever that they're whoever they're delegating access to. So we've actually taken this uh, a step further, specifically for, for dApps, and we've created a decentralized version of proxy re-encryption. So instead of just one proxy and one re-encryption key, we can split the re-encryption key up into a bunch of shares, distribute those shares uh, across multiple nodes in the new Cypher network, and require some quorum or threshold of those nodes or those key shares to come together in order to perform the re-encryption. So there's a couple benefits for this. One is it adds in a bunch of redundancy to the system. So if a proxy goes offline or becomes malicious, as long as a quorum or threshold of the proxies are still available, uh, it will work. Um, it also makes things like collusion attacks much harder. So what we've created here is, is basically a decentralized key management service uh, that enables access controls for dApps. And you don't have to trust Amazon Cloud HSM or Azure Key Vault or even New Cypher ourselves. Uh, I'll just touch briefly on this because this is more sort of the details of the implementation, but um, basically it uses this idea of key encapsulation and data encapsulation. So you encrypt the bulk of the data with symmetric key, which is very fast, and you're just performing the re-encryption, which is an elliptic curve function on this encrypted symmetric key. Um, so regardless of how much data, whether it's megabytes or gigabytes, the re-encryption is always uh, the same speed. Uh, and then we've also tokenized the protocol. And in this case, specifically, it's a work token. So if you want to be one of the nodes or one of the proxies in the new Cypher network and provide this re-encryption service in exchange for earning fees paid by users as well as uh, block rewards according to our inflation schedule, you have to stake the new Cypher token as a kind of collateral or bond. So a, a good analogy might be a taxi medallion. If you have a taxi medallion, you're able to drive people around in a yellow cab in New York, if you have the new Cypher token staked, you're able to provide re-encryption services. Um, so we use that for a couple things. One, to allocate work and subsequently reward. So if you're staking 10% of the staked tokens in the new Cypher network, you'll probabilistically get 10% of the re-encryption work, 10% of the rewards. And we also use it as a way to ensure correctness of computation. So if you are a node and you become malicious or you go offline, or for some reason you just stop doing the job that you're supposed to be doing, your stake can get slashed. Uh, and users actually, if you've built a dApp on top of New Cypher, you don't have to worry about the New Cypher token at all. So it's not a payment token. You just pay fees right now in ETH, in the future potentially some sort of stable coin. Um, so we're very consciously kind of a, uh, avoiding this idea of a payment token because we believe it just introduces this artificial barrier uh, to adoption. So New Cypher is specifically, uh, or very specifically, just a staking token. Uh, we've got probably 25 or 30 or so applications that are being built on New Cypher right now. Uh, just a few samples, uh, a lot of healthcare projects, so projects like Mediblock or IRYO, Wholesome, that are trying to build patient-controlled medical record systems. So the patient controls the key, they control the record, they're able to share that record with a doctor or hospital. We work with a lot of the decentralized databases like BlueZell and Wolk to provide their access control layer. Um, also several decentralized data marketplaces or data exchanges like Datum or Ocean Protocol that are aggregating different sorts of data. It could be user browsing history, social media data, genomics data, encrypting it, and then monetizing that data by selling it to researchers or advertisers. And what they can do is they can use New Cypher to conditionally decrypt the data in exchange for payment. Uh, we'll be launching on Testnet in the next several weeks, likely this month. 
uh, with mainnet probably sometime in late summer. Uh, if you're building a dApp and you are managing private data or have some requirement to share private data uh, between users, uh, we'd love to help solve that problem with, for you. Um, you can check us out on GitHub. All of our development happens in the open source or, or in the open on Discord. Um, so you can come and chat with us and ask us questions there. Uh, we have a, a technical or scientific white paper on our website as well, which goes into a lot more detail on the architecture and mechanics of the system that I can cover today. Um, or you can just email me at mclean at newcipher.com. Thanks very much. And happy to answer any questions if there are any. Space for a couple of questions. Great. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so the proxy will give access to the re-encryption key based on verifying some funds are deposited into a, a smart wallet? Or how would that work? Yeah, so the way that you could do conditional re-encryption, right? So you combine new cipher or this proxy re-encryption layer with a smart contract, and then the proxy will re-encrypt or not re-encrypt based off of you know, the output of a smart contract. So you could say, you could time box it, say only re-encrypt within you know, these certain blocks, or only re-encrypt if the recipient has paid you know, some amount of ETH to the data owner's address. Um, or in the future, if we have oracles that are connected to the outside world, you could peg it to sort of any arbitrary real world, real world event. Uh, and then the only thing that's protecting the data from malicious access by the proxy is the tokenized private key. So actually, the interesting thing about proxy re-encryption is the proxy, even if the entire network became malicious, the proxies would not ever be able to actually uh, get access to the plain text data. So the re-encryption key, the only thing a re-encryption key can do is re-encrypt data. It can't be used to decrypt data. Um, so you can compare this to like, if you imagine creating like a system that was built off Shamir secret sharing with private keys, if someone controls the whole network, they can decrypt all the data. The difference here is that they can only sort of arbitrarily re-encrypt data. So they'd have to compromise the network as well as compromise some recipient. Um, but with just the re-encryption key, you can sort of avoid these conditions, um, but you can't decrypt. Yeah, if I can ask more questions. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so how would you prevent the proxy from just re-encrypting the data to a private key that it controls? So the proxy does not, so the only thing that ever goes out to the network is this re-encryption key. Um, so the proxy never has the private key either. The way that we prevent, or the way that we ensure proxies basically behave correctly and only re-encrypt when they should is using smart contracts and this economic incentive. So if a proxy, if a proxy re-encrypts outside of the conditions that are specified by the user, we have a challenge protocol where someone can provide a proof that a, a, a proxy was malicious or misbehaving, uh, and the stake would get slashed. And it also helps with the split key version. So no one, if any one proxy becomes malicious, they only have some share. They don't have the entire re-encryption key, so there's only so much they could do. They'd have to have a sufficient quorum of those proxies to simultaneously become malicious uh, in order to sort of arbitrarily re-encrypt. Yep. Thank you, McLean. Thank you.